So welcome to another installment of our uh, Intro to Buddhism videos. Uh, my name is Aaron Prophet. I'm an Associate Professor of Japanese Studies at the University at Albany, and today we'll be talking about the Heart Sutra. Uh, the Heart Sutra is one of, if not the most, most popular and most widely used sutra in the Mahayana Buddhist world. You can hear it chanted in Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Sanskrit, Vietnamese, um, Tibetan, all sorts of other languages. Um, it's, it's very popular um, and, and said to be very potent. Uh, it's very short. I think in Chinese, that's 262 characters or something like that. It's very short, but very potent, said to distill the whole of Buddhist wisdom. Now, um, today I'll be giving a little presentation about the, the, the literary uh, and cultural history kind of what people do with the Heart Sutra, um, as well as provide my own translation and general discussion of some of the ideas. But to start off, I thought I would chant the Heart Sutra. Here's a, a copy of it that I got from Japan um, so that you can hear it and then we'll dig into what it means. So if you'll bear with me. Maka Hanya Haramita Shingyo Kanji Zai Bosa Gyojin Hanya Haramita Ji Shokin Go Unkai Kudo Isai Kuyaku Shari Shi Shiki Hui Kuku Hui Shiki Shiki Sokuse Kuku Sokuse Shiki Juso gyo jiki yakubu nyo ze shari shi ze sho ho ku so fu sho fu betsu fu ku fu jo fu so fu gen ze ko ku chu mu shiki mu shu so gyo shiki mu gen ni bi ze shin ni mu shiki sho ko mi so ko ho mu gen kai nai shi mu i shiki kai mu mu myo Yakumu mu myo jin nai shi mu ro shi yakumu ro shi jin mu ku shu metsu do mu chi yakumu toku i mu sho toko bodai satta e hanya hara mita ko shin mu kege mu kege ko mu u ku hu onni i sai Tendo mu so ku hyo ne han san ze sho butsu e hanya hara mita ko toku a no kutara san yaku san bo dai ko chi hanya hara mita ze dai jin shu ze dai myo shu ze mu jo shu ze mu todo shu no jo i sai ku shin jitsu hu ko Ko setsu hanya hara mita shu soku se shu watsu gatte gatte hara gatte hara so gatte boji so aka hanya shingyo. Okay, so that is the, uh, the this, you know, kind of a simple way of chanting. Um, I'm going to let, let one person in. Um, now I would like to turn to my own translation of the text um, to talk about what we just heard. So, um, let's see. All right, so I'm going to go to up here. All right, so the title rendered in Sanskrit is Ma uh, Maha Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. Uh, in Japanese, we'd pronounce this Bu Setsu, the two, first two characters, Bu Setsu means the Buddha preaches, right? So this is, you know, the, the, the way many sutras begin. Bu setsu maka hanya haramita shingyo, okay? In English, we would translate this as the heart of the perfect, the great perfection of wisdom as preached by Shakyamuni Buddha, okay? So I'm going to read it in English, but then also provide a little, you know, commentary and explanation here. Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, while coursing deeply in the perfection of wisdom, realize that the five components of sentient existence, the five skandhas, are actually shunyata, in other words, lacking a fixed nature or unchanging essence, and thus overcame all misfortune and pain. Now, the Prajnaparamita, this is the perfection of wisdom, this is a wisdom text, but it's interesting that the Bodhisattva of compassion is the one who introduces it to us. 
right? What is it about wisdom and compassion that are related? Some might say that true wisdom is compassionate and true compassion is ultimately wise. Um, Avalokiteshvara, you know, while practicing the perfect of perfect wisdom, realizes that the component elements that make up a person, mental and physical elements that make us what we are, are fundamentally lacking in the unchanging core. In other words, everything about us, everything that makes us up, we are composite, we are impermanent, we are in a state of flow, and everything that we're made of is as well, right? Uh, in many world traditions, you th might think of the soul as the the diamond in a lump of coal and through a religious practice you liberate the soul okay that, that's one way of thinking in the buddhist view i think it's more like a river that the self is this ever flowing changing thing that is made of other things and always you know kind of part of this broader uh, context when you realize that there's no unchanging essence that gives you the freedom to change to transform and to let go uh, of anything O Shariputra, form, or rupa, is not different from shunyata. Shunyata is not different from form. Form itself is shunyata. Shunyata itself is form. Right? So th this term rupa, this is, this is the first of the five skandhas. It's our form, our physical form. Right? But it's also about the world. Like the, the forms that we encounter in the world are not separate from this idea shunyata. Now shunyata is often translated as emptiness. And really, this is what the Heart Sutra and Perfect Wisdom is about, is emptiness, right? Um, so, shunyata means that there is a lack, a lack of an essential core, lack of essence, lack of, um, you know, unchanging qualities, because everything that we can identify in the world, in samsara, is composite, impermanent, and fundamentally lacking of unchanging qualities right that, that is what uh, those are called the three marks of conditioned existence right now shunyata this this is one of the key passages here you know shiki so uh, shiki fu i ku fu uh, ku fu i shiki shiki soku ze ku ku soku ze shiki form is not different from shunyata many people study shunyata as if it's philosophy as if it's metaphysics as if, it, as if it's some other thing apart from lived existence but Really, shunyata is just stuff, stuff correctly understood. Um, I sometimes joke that my, uh, um, you know, my hippie friend might say, it's all just energy, man. It's all just stardust. We're all just stardust. It's like, yeah, like that's basically, tr basically right, right? It's basically true. It is just this ever flowing, changing energy and we're part of it, right? But we project onto the world coherence and imagine things to be set in their ways, people to be set in their ways, but really it's all open, right? Shinyata is often translated as nothingness or emptiness. Another a, a scholar named, uh, was it Nancy, uh, was it M McCagney? Nancy McCagney uh, refers to it as openness. And I really like that term too. Uh, so this character here, Ku, Ku can mean open, it can mean empty. Right, so you know, emptiness, you know, empty. Um, it can also mean sky, you know, a sky, bright, blue, clear, cloudless sky, like limitless possibilities. Um, there's a great philosopher we'll talk about later named Nagarjuna. Maybe we'll do a whole presentation just on Nagarjuna. And in his great work, there's a famous quote. He says, uh, for whom shunyata is possible, all things are possible. In other words, if you look at the world as having a fixed nature, nothing is possible because everything is the way that it is. But if you look at the world as open and open to change and uh, fundamentally in motion, then anything is possible. Then th things can change, right? Good, the bad, and everything in between, right? So one of the keys here is that shunyata is not some other state, not somehow apart from form, but it's right here, right now, what we're doing, right? But what we're doing as understood from the perspective of a Buddha, okay? So first, Shunyata is not different than form. Now we're moving on to sensations, perception, volition, consciousness are also like this. So these are the five, you know, Rupa, Vedana, Samjnya, Samskara, Vijnana. These are the five constituent elements that make up the human being. Now, here's where things get interesting. Here's where things get a little Mahayana y. Okay. Next step O Shariputra, all the constituent elements of reality dharmas, you can think of them like atoms, are shunyata. They are neither created nor destroyed, neither defiled nor pure, neither increasing nor decreasing. 
Later on, a school of Buddhist philosophy named Abhidharma develops, and within the Abhidharma system, they acknowledge, yes, everything is composite, everything changes, um, but there are these fundamental elements. The Abhidharma Kaza will argue that these fundamental elements are what we might call atoms in our you know, modern parlance, or what the Greeks called atoms, um, and those are fundamental. Those are really real. Okay. From the Shunyata perspective, especially in the philosophy of Nagarjuna, the progeny of Haramita, Sutra literature as well, even the atoms are splittable, right? So, you know, 2,000 years later when they finally split the atom, I'm sure Mahayana philosophers are like, yeah, we know, it's splittable, everything is. Everything is composite, everything is fluid, keep going down and down, we got quarks and whatever they're made of, et cetera, et cetera, right? So all things are likewise Shunyata. All, even the most fundamental elements are similarly open and transforming and composite and impermanent, so on and so forth, right? Therefore, shunyata has no form, no sensation, no perception, no volition, no consciousness. Uh, as well. So uh, the, the, the constituent elements of the human being are in this state of the state of motion and movement right none of the five skandhas none of the five elements of the human being are you know um ultimately real okay well we'll talk about that to be ultimately real and in other words everything is in motion everything is always changing everything is impermanent and composite and so on right now we go on to the senses right so the no, no eye, no ear, no tongue, no nose, no body, no mind, no form, sound, smell, taste, touch, conception, no realm of sight, no realm of consciousness, etc. Right? So it's said that the human being has six senses eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Mind is considered one of the senses that coordinates our sensory experience. Okay. The, ob the, the organ of sense perception, the eye, encounters an object of sense perception. Oh, it's this nice little, nice little bell. Oh, I look at that and go, oh, that's pretty. I like that. So organ of sense perception encounters object of sense perception, which gives rise to eye consciousness. Okay. So one, two, three. Okay. But you can do this for all six. All six, as they encounter objects in the world, they give rise to feelings, right? Uh, positive, negative, neutral, and so on. And that coordination of sensory experience is where our sense of self arises from. But using here the Heart Sutra, you're then deconstructing each of these. It doesn't mean there is no I, it's right here, right? One time when I was, uh, I was living in the Zen Hermitage in Kyoto many years ago, and uh, the Zen master asked me a question, what is the nature of self? So I, you know, I push up my PhD student glass and I say, well, there is no self. At that time, he punched me right here. I said, then what was that, right? So when we're playing with the idea of shunyata, we're not saying that these things don't exist, it's that these things don't necessarily exist in the way that we normally think of them. Normally we think of things as existing inherently, really real, right? But in fact, everything is in, motion everything is fluid everything is composite ever changing and that includes everything about us our eye ear nose tongue body so it, it, everything about us that processes reality and everything that we might encounter the consciousness that arises from that encounter and so on all the way down to sphere of consciousness or realm of consciousness okay but it goes further right so deconstructing the self sure we can do that, 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 you know that's no problem Right? In European philosophy, Descartes gets to, I think, therefore I am, and the Buddhists are like, yeah, dude, you just got started. Keep going, right? So keep digging deeper. No ignorance and no end of ignorance. No old age and death, no end to old age and death. So now we've now deconstructed the fundamental human problem, ignorance, birth, old age, sickness, and death, and the so-called solution, right? So it's now taking kind of the superficial view of samsara the realm of death and rebirth but also superficial views of the buddhist path as well in breaking those down like ultimately what is going on we keep going further and further no dukkha origin of dukkha cessation of dukkha nirvana no or, or path no wisdom and no attainment of buddhahood so now it feels as if we've just gotten rid of the four noble truths and the eightfold path and the very idea of wisdom and nirvana and buddhahood that's not exactly what's going on it's rather looking at each of these the way we norm we're normally going to conceive them we're going to thingify all these things and say ah here's what they really are and i think the heart sutra is pushing us to deconstruct even those things 
right? The famous Zen master Lin Ji says, or Chan, you know, in China, Chan, the Chan master Lin Ji says, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Okay? What I've always t- taken that to mean is that if you think you've got it all figured out, keep going. Think more deeply. Right, so I think part of this perfection of wisdom is entering into a mode of continually questioning, especially those things you think you know, like Buddha. Right, what what is it? Right, keep going, keep keep looking. Right, with nothing to attain, therefore the bodhisattva relies on the perfection of wisdom. The minds of bodhisattvas are without obstruction. Without obstruction, therefore the mind of a bodhisattva is without fear. It's fearless. And far removed from all confusion and delusion, they fully reach nirvana. So it seems to be that reaching nirvana is not about reaching or reaching for nirvana. It seems that reaching nirvana is letting go of everything, even the quest for nirvana, maybe. And I want to point out this this interesting term here, um, uh, tendo muso. This is like upside down thinking and like dreamlike thinking. I think that's really interesting. I like that. Um, okay. All Buddhas of the three worlds. I've kind of you know again this term here can be rely or live or you know embody. You know I've kind of played around with that in different translations. Uh, the perfection of wisdom and therefore attain unsurpassed perfect enlightenment. It's one of my favorite terms to make students say in class Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Here, say it with me. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. One more time, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. It's one of these long, great Sanskrit terms. And it means complete, perfect, unsurpassed, perfect enlightenment, right? Therefore, know that the perfection of wisdom is the great marvelous spell, the great illuminating spell, the unsurpassed spell, the unequaled spell that illuminates all suffering that is true and not false. Now, if you look at other translations, you're going to see this term here, here in Japanese, shu, I think in Chinese is zhou, maybe, um, zhou, uh, anyway, so shu, you'll often see it translated as mantra, okay, and that's not wrong, uh, I've also seen it translated as dadani. Now, you'll encounter scholars who will clearly distinguish between spell, mantra, and dadani. Usually a spell is, you know, you kind of say the thing, make something happen in the world. A mantra is a, you know, a thing that you kind of employ in meditation. And a dadani is like a mantra, but much, much longer, right? Um, but, uh, but actually, if you look at the texts in Chinese and Japanese and so on, um, there's a lot of ambiguity between what a spell or a mantra or a dadani may be. And I think that, I think that ambiguity is really interesting. What is a spell? Right. Um, the last night, my family went to go see uh, what's his name, uh, Justin Willman, the guy who does Magic for Humans. Okay, um, you know, d- does performance in Albany. It was delightful. Uh, kids loved it. Um, but what is magic? Right, it's misdirection. It's tricking you. It's fun and all this stuff. It's showing you that what you think you know might not be all that's going on. Right, you think this one thing, but then something else turns out altogether. Right. So a spell or like doing a magic trick is about showing you how how the mind works, uh, or rather how we think the mind works, but then we can be tricked, right? A classical exam, ex, an example from uh, Indian philosophy is you walk into a dark room and oh no, there's a snake coiled up in the corner. You turn the lamp on and oh, it was a rope, not a snake. But in that moment where your mind saw the snake, that was fear, and that fear feels real, right? The world that we construct in our minds feels real, but there's more to it. So spells are sometimes spells or mantra or whatever are, are often kind of a symbol for shunyata or kind of what understanding perfect wisdom and shunyata actually do to your mind because it breaks things down. It surprises you and shows you that there's something else going on altogether. So um, I actually prefer to use the term spell because I know how the term spell is used. Um, another example is the first chapter of the um, Mahavarochana Sutra. At the end of chapter one, they talk about spells and mantras and why, you know, the w- same way that a magician might conjure up some image, it's kind of what our mind is doing all the time, is conjuring up this reality and then taking it to be real, right? There's another great uh, Zen story of this great painter who goes into the, the, the cave and he paints 
um, a dragon by candlelight. They, you know, and when you're you know in one of these caves and the the candle is flickering, the dragon is so well painted it looks like it's coming to life, and he gets scared of his own creation, and that's the thing that we're doing all the time, right? So therefore, pro proclaim the perfect wisdom spell. Recite the spell saying, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhisvaha, which I have heard translated as gone, gone beyond, gone altogether beyond. Oh, what an awakening. All hail. Um, I, I like that translation of the mantra. Thing about mantras or spells is that the meaning is not really that important. The important part is saying it, right? So not only do we have a mantra within the Heart Sutra, but the Heart Sutra itself can be thought of as a mantra. So chanting the whole thing. At the beginning of, of our time today, I chanted. It took like a minute, two minutes, something like that, right? You get good at it, you can do it in like 30 seconds. I've seen people really, really fly through it. Um, but it becomes a mantra unto itself, right? And mantras are said to have these great powers to transform the world. Now, um, I am going to, let's see, I'll stop the share. And now that we've kind of covered, so you've heard the text, we've give, gone through an English translation, I've tried to explain some of the basic ideas. And now what I would like to do is place the Heart Sutra in historical um, and uh, literary context. So let's see, I will share again, this time my PowerPoint. There we go. All right. So again, here is my um, you know basic contact info. If you're interested in checking out some of the other videos for, for uh, um, that we have with the American Buddhist Study Center, or you have a question about this one, please feel free to contact me. I love getting emails, and if I don't get back to you, just shoot me another email because often important emails get buried by other stuff. <laughs> All right. So. Prajna Paramita, or perfection of wisdom. So I've already said that as if you already know what that is, right? So the pr Prajna Paramita, or perfection of wisdom, is an early genre of Buddhist writing, perhaps being written down in the first century BCE, okay? Um, early Buddhist history is really hard to pin down. Uh, people often talk about, you know, this tradition or that tradition or this text or this text as early or late and, you know, it's, it's actually harder to pin down than that. So let's just call it an early as opposed to today, which is, you know, whatever. But um, one of the critiques that we often see associated with uh, perfection of wisdom is kind of going after Abhidharma. So Abhidharma being an early school of Buddhist philosophy that perfection of wisdom literature is kind of running counter to. Now, um, as I mentioned before, one of the things that the Abhidharmakas are yeah, but one of the things that the Abhidharma uh, philosophers are talking about is, you know, the nature of change and impermanence, but then also the fundamental elements of reality, mental and physical, that make up the world. And through understanding these fundamental elements, you can, you know, reach enlightenment. Yeah. Well, perfection of wisdom, and then later on, Madhyamaka uh, philosophy are going to come in and say, well, actually, even those fundamental elements or dharmas. Um, are, are not ultimately real. And this, this term ultimately real, I want to talk about more in a moment. Um, so I know that it's confusing to call various things dharmas, right? And when, when you study South Asian religion, you have dharma as in like in the Hindu traditions, like your path in life, like if you're born into a warrior family, your dharma is a warrior's dharma, right? But then in Buddhism, we talk about dharma with a capital D as in the truth, the law, the way, right? Um, you know, uh, the truth with a capital T, the law with a capital L. It's, it's you know, the Buddha's teachings about reality. Yeah. Uh, but then also in the, this, you know, particular philosophical context, I call it Dharma with a little d. Uh, the, those are the atoms. Okay. And perfection of wisdom is kind of taking this, de I like to call it deconstructionist perspective that sees all things as composite, impermanent, and lacking of any unchanging qualities. Uh, like the Buddhist teaching of no self, um, and applying it to everything, even the so-called fundamental elements of reality. Uh, perfection of wisdom literature really emphasizes the progression along the bodhisattva path, uh, the path to becoming a Buddha. Uh, one of my favorite stories about the perfection of wisdom literature is that supposedly 
the great philosopher Nagarjuna, who perhaps lived you know around 150, 250 ish. We don't really, yeah, nobody really knows. Um, that he supposedly uh, received the perfection of wisdom literature from the Dragon King on the bottom of the ocean, which I just think is super cool. Um, that I, I, lo I love all those stories like that. Um, the the perfection of wisdom, Prajna Paramita, uh, is sometimes conceived of as a female goddess. And she's referred to as the mother of all Buddhas. I'll show you a lovely image later on. The key term in Prajna Paramita uh, um, Sutra literature, uh, which is then later systematized into Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka philosophy. And again, we might do a whole day just on that. This um, is really focused on Shunyata. Now, like I said, Shunyata is often referred to as emptiness, but I like the term openness as well. I actually have this book right here, um, so it's another, you know, a discussion of it. And then here in this book, this is a, a Nancy McCagney Nagarjuna in the philosophy of openness. I think this is a, I think this is a fun text, a fun way of approaching this problem, right? And you know, essentially, this idea that wisdom, you know, that, that, that this is the wisdom that is beyond agent, beyond object, beyond action, as ultimately real. So, so now it doesn't mean that. I don't exist, doesn't mean the world doesn't exist, doesn't mean you know, things don't exist. It rather means things do not exist ultimately. And by ultimate, we mean having an unchanging essence, right? Fundamental characteristics that are, you know, um, you know essential. Okay? Rather than saying that everything is composite, ever-changing, and in a state of flow. The term shunyata is also very closely related to the concept of no self, Right? Uh, as well as the, the teaching of dependent origination or pratitya samutpada. Uh, so some people will even argue that shunyata basically is pratitya samutpada, yeah. which is kind of, you know, you know, the, the, you know, one of the fundamental aspects of the Buddha's awakening under the Bodhi tree. So in a sense, you could think of, you know, Prajna Paramita as kind of trying to get back to some of those basic insights of the Buddha. We use this term paramita, means perfections. There are you know, six traditional perfections. There's ten, there's various lists, but we have generosity, which is dana, uh, ethical discipline, or shila, patience, kshanti, enthusiastic effort, virya. Notice that the word virya kind of sounds like virile, right? Because, um, you, know, the, the, you know, Sanskrit and English, Latin, and Greek are all kind of distantly related in the Indo-European language family. Concentration or dhyana, also where the word Zen comes from, right? And then uh, prajna, which is wisdom. Yeah. So these are the six basic ones. Um, uh, this term patience or kshanti, I've also heard explained as endurance, that if you understand the nature of reality, that can kind of freak you out. So you have to be able to endure what that insight entails because, whoa, like if you see the big picture, like that's, that could be upsetting in a sense, you know? Um, all right, there are many Prajna Paramita texts. So one of the basic ones, the Ashta Sahasrika Prajna Paramita, this is the Prajna Paramita Sutra in 8,000 lines. There's another one in 25,000 lines. There's one in 100,000 lines. And then the Chinese monk Xuanzang, he goes to China and brings back the you know Maha Prajna Paramita, often called the Big Sutra, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the two most famous ones, are the Vajra Chedika and the heart uh, and the you know Hridaya. So Vajra Chedika, Prajna Paramita, this is what we call the Diamond Sutra, and the Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, the Heart Sutra. And these two, Diamond Sutra, Heart Sutra, and then the Lotus Sutra, these three sutras are usually known by their English name. And that's just very interesting, right? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about doing another presentation just on the Diamond Sutra because it's super fun. It's also maybe the world's first mass-produced printed book, which is really cool. Uh, but you know, that'll be for a, for a later occasion. These sutras begin kind of small, but they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But then eventually they get smaller, smaller, smaller until you even have a perfection of wisdom sutra in one sound, one syllable, ah. Right, so this is the ah of the Aji Khan, the ah syllable contemplation, the Shingon tradition. But just this letter ah as the fundamental origin of all things. Okay, the, uh, it said that this is the eternal mantra of the great cosmic Buddha. But what is ah grammatically? Ah 
is a negative prefix. Like we have the term ahistorical, that a, that a ah, is a negation particle. Same thing in Sanskrit. So that fundamental origin, a, ah, is itself shunyata or emptiness. Isn't that cool? I think that's really cool. All right. So here is the heart. So here's a here's a Sanskrit version. I believe this was uh, um, uh, I believe this one was found in a temple in Japan, actually. Uh, so the full name, Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, the heart of the perfection of wisdom. This is perhaps one of the most widely known practice and studied of all Mahayana sutras. It's you know countless uh, texts that I've seen in Japan in different temples. Um, there are Indian commentaries, uh, Kamala Shila, Vimala Mitra, Atisha, uh, Deepam Kara Shri Jnana. Um, there are also many East Asian co uh, commentaries like Fatsang, uh, Kukai, Hakuin, and so on. Um, one popular academic theory posits that uh, the best known version of the Heart Sutra, the one translated by Xuanzang in 649, was actually taken from the Mahaprajnaparamita text uh, and then back translated into Sanskrit. And um, the, the, the Sanskrit is a, a language that Xuanzang was very fluent in. So in other words, this theory states that the Heart Sutra was composed in Chinese and then back translated into Sanskrit, went to India and then Tibet. And then everyone imagined that it was a Sanskrit text that then was translated into Chinese, but it may have been the opposite. Um, and there are other examples of this. So, for example, the Tao Te Ching, the classic Taoist text, apparently was also translated into Sanskrit and sent to India. And I think that's wild. Um, so, but there's debate. There's some people who really hate that theory and then others who say, yeah, it sounds, sounds right to me. So, I don't know. It, uh, this is not my area of specialty. So, just let you know, there's this debate out there and it's really interesting to me. Um, next. So here's, here's this, these ideas, you know, explaining emptiness. How do you explain emptiness? I don't even know. Uh, I'm supposed to be teaching a seminar on emptiness and every day. <laughs> it, it, it's a whole thing. All right, so we have the five aggregates. The five constituent elements of the human being are lacking of swabhava. Swabhava is this key term for essential nature, intrinsic nature, uh, uh, own being, self-being. Um, and shunyata is a rejection of that. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Emptiness is our under our ordinary reality as it truly is, not an underlying reality, it's just reality, right? Nirvana is awakening, nirvana and awakening is likewise not apart from our ordinary reality. It's all here right now, right? We just gotta wake up to it, take our glasses off, you know, or take our blinders off, right? And then we have the wonderful mantra, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisvaha, um, gone, gone, Gone beyond, gone completely beyond. Oh, what an awakening! All right. So here is uh, Prajna Paramita as a goddess here depicted in this female form, and uh, I think this is really interesting because, you know, if you spend time reading Buddhist literature, you see a lot of Buddhist misogyny. Uh, the patriarchy is strong uh, in this elite classical literature written by celibate dudes living in you know mountain temples. And yet here we have, you know, like the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, often depicted as female in the East Asian context. And here the embodiment of perfection of wisdom is also female. I think that's important and interesting and something that, you know, we in our modern context could perhaps amplify and uh, further draw upon. Okay. The Heart Sutra is used in all sorts of creative ways. Um, uh, I was looking for it and I can't find it, but I have a a uh, uh, like a furoshiki that are, or like like a uh, like a sweat uh, rag for going on pilgrimage. I often saw people tie it around their head, and like this is a Buddhist scripture, okay? And you know people get it tattooed, like in this image, or maybe on a necktie, or on all sorts of other things. And if the core teaching is that material reality is awakening, right? That the world is awakening, that ordinary reality is itself awakening. Why not have it on everything, right? So one day, you know, I'm walking around and I have this, you know, thing wrapped around my head. Um, there's the Heart Sutra. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you would never do that with, like, the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John from the Bible. Like, like we typically don't take sacred texts and then use them as stuff. But in the hearts, case of the Heart Sutra, that seems to be not the case, right? Um, so, uh, but one of the other cool things that people do with the Heart Sutra is copy it. 
right? So the, the Shakyo is just sutra copying. Uh, and the Heart Sutra is one of the most popular ones. I've also seen the Ju Sege, which you, which you see in the Jodo Shinchu tradition. Oh, by the way, which reminds me, um, across China, Korea, Vietnam, Tibet, etc., like the Heart Sutra is ubiquitous. Okay, in Japanese Buddhism, also ubiquitous. Uh, Zen, Shingon, Tendai, even Jodo Shu, the school of Honen, you know, you know, everybody uses it. However, Jodo Shinshu and Nichiren Shu do not. I think I've always thought that was very interesting. So there are two schools of Japanese Buddhism that don't denigrate the Heart Sutra, but but it's not part of their practice, right? Interestingly enough, though, however, that in America, uh, many Jodo Shinshu temples that teach meditation will also incorporate the Heart Sutra into the meditation day. But for regular service, they tend to not use they don't use it, right? That's interesting, and that's the thing I'd like to explore more and learn about that. And you know, because so incorporating the Heart Sutra has become a thing that some Shin Buddhists in America are starting to do. And I think that's that's uh, the, you know, a thing to investigate further. So, in any case, all right, why might one copy a sutra? Well, copying sutras can be a form of meditation. I'll be honest with you, the first time I sat to uh, copy a sutra, I got super bored about halfway through. But anyway, that's part of meditation. You as you encounter that busy, busy mind, and you kind of move past it. Also devotion, right? So devotion to the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. I, I saw one, uh, a, a depiction of the Heart Sutra as a stupa with the Buddha Amitabha in the center of it. Uh, sutras can be chanted for protection, uh, to alleviate sickness, to achieve success in academic or professional context, to, to generate merit and then share that merit with others. So if you look here, um, what you often have is, you know, the, the date, the, you know, somebody's address, you know, you know, a date, a name, somebody's address, and then why you're chanting it, right? So what is your wish? What is your, your desire, your need that this merit is being dedicated to? Um, so, and then here we have this nice little uh, picture of a room where people are chanting, you, know, uh, you know, doing the, the Heart Sutra, um, you know, copying the Heart Sutra. And if you ever go to a temple and they're doing shakyo, you should check it out because it's actually really lovely. Um, so with that, I'll conclude. Um, stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions or comments, I look forward to, hear, to hearing from you.